Yes, it's a, it's a very long title and a very long sort of mouthful. Um, and I want to talk about just different fields, conceptual fields and domains, and how um, to think about these domains and how they live together, how they marry, how they articulate to one another, and how that creates difficulties around integration of different fields. So that's kind of what I want to talk about, and I think Bernstein is very useful for that. And um, just briefly around formal communities, formal communities are delineated by identity, by name, by profession, by title, rank or membership. Formal communities are also delineated by an in and out group or gatekeeping mechanisms. And um, they might be binary, binary like you either are a social worker and, and registered with a board or you are not. Then um, that's a binary sort of formal communities. Or they might be described by um, an assertional negation principle, which is you might either be an academic or you're a non-academic. Then you all the other things, I'm a non-academic. Um, so that's kind of where um, the assertional negation principle comes in when you are not that. We're not quite sure what you are, but it's not that. And then we're all familiar with the concept of communities of practice. Um, and it describes, the concept describes a community which is legitimized through practice and participation. It's quite useful to think of it um, in those sorts of loose terms. And the other part of formal communities are epistemic communities. And these might have different disciplinary and professional backgrounds, but members share an understanding and intentions around a unifying goal and have shared notions of validity, so they accept knowledge, the validity of certain knowledge in similar ways, so they accept similar knowledge um, or is acceptable to them. And they have a normative component around the betterment of society and how it's introduced that as the epistemic community. Obviously, he's the, I think he was originally the one who coined that term. The next one is just briefly again, I want to just define and be clear to us about what discursive communities are. These are understood as a group of communicators with a common goal or interest that adopts certain preferred ways of participating in public discussions. So it has these of distinctive um, discursive practices. They have a particular language that they use. Generally, membership in a discursive community requires a certain level of expertise. The more expert one is, according to a ranking system that everybody agrees on, the more influence one has in this, in this discursive community. I um, mean, Porter, I thought, uh, provided a very nice uh, definition saying it's a local and temporary constraining system defined by discursive practices that are unified by a common focus, has stated and unstated conventions, mechanisms for wielding power and institutional hierarchies, and has a vested interest and so forth. So it is about um, language, or using language or using a particular way of speaking with one another about things that keeps people in or out. The boundaries are often fluid, nebulous, and of course overlap. And I just want to call this to mind before I sort of go on with my presentations um, about the formal and discursive communities at GWC. So briefly, Bernstein in notions of fields and context. Bernstein's notion of recontextualizing fields is a very useful framework for understanding the nexus of student affairs and academic affairs. And I'm talking about that intersection. How do we how do we find a way of, of bringing these two domains together and having them articulate and talk to one another? And Bernstein's idea of taking knowledge from one domain and using it in other domains is quite a useful framework. So Bernstein defines a field as a socio-cultural and epistemological domain. It can be conceptual, it can be discursive, it can be structural, but it's usually delegitimized by power relations. So that's a field that, um, that Bernstein talks about. This talks about two distinct fields. The one is the official recontextualizing field, which is described within universities, described as the official administrative management policy and non-academic domain. You're quite familiar with that domain. It's about, um, uh, well, I don't need to expand on that one. The pedagogic recontextualizing field um, refers to the domain of knowledge construction and reconstruction. It's a discipline-specific discourse domain. It has curriculum in it, it has teaching and learning and all kinds of things that we consider part of pedagogic thinking and pedagogic discourses at university. And these two together with a third field, which is not Bernstein's notion, um, the social domain constitutes key institutional domains where the interplay of mediating factors in student experiences takes place. 
So it's these three fields that I want to use. It's the official field, the official recontextualizing field that Benson speaks about, the pedagogic recontextualizing field, and the social domain. The social domain was a term that was coined by the... Oh, I'll speak about that in a minute. Okay, so the focus then on my paper is to understand the relational interplay and integration of the formal, discursive, and epistemic, epistemic fields and communities. The focus is to explore the relational interplay and integration of student affairs with academic affairs as it manifests in an extended program. We've got a program in the science faculty that you might be familiar with. I've, I've reported on this program over the years. Um, it's in the science faculty, it's in an extended program where we have student affairs practitioners and academic staff having to manage this program together, having to work together side by side in this program. And so this is what I'm trying to describe to you here. So overall, there seems to be a disjuncture between student affairs, academic affairs, teaching, learning, research, structural and policy-related imperatives and administration, and then classroom practices and the student experience. So there's, there's at times, I find, not an articulation. There might be an articulation around content and so forth, but really from a structural point of view or from a power and relational point of view, these things seem to be at times not articulated. They're not, um, they don't speak to enough, uh, each other enough. So the recontextualization between fields creates a disjuncture and tensions. So there's an articulation gap by migrating knowledge across certain fields. So you might find that there's, in the official recontextualizing field, there might be an IOP strategy, there might be a decision that we need to um, have um, uh, living and learning programs in the foundation. So that comes from management, that comes from the IOP strategy, that comes from a thinking in a particular domain. It then migrates, this idea then migrates, and this knowledge, this um, idea then migrates all the way into the first year experience of students and then needs to be delivered in the classroom. And this is what I'm trying to talk about. What happens to that when it migrates and arrives in the classroom? How do we deal with that? So the related research and migrated knowledge from one field to the other creates a disjuncture. The classroom experience is, is then experienced as perhaps alien or literally there's relocated knowledge, relocated um, or dislocated policies or knowledge or things happen in the classroom that come clearly from another domain. So just to briefly speak to you about student affairs field, the field of student affairs um, itself, the, the field of student affairs is straddling these fields and domains, the official, pedagogic and the social domain. Student affairs finds itself in the pluralist intersection between the co-curricular and the curricular, between the affective and cognitive, between faculty and students, between administration and the social domain. And quoting here a lot of our local people, you may be familiar with Jenny Case and Jess Langer and Ian Scott, who speak about student affairs in these kinds of ways, saying it is not quite clear where it fits in. It's not quite clear how its framework is conceptualized. Um, what theories it uses, and how does it manage to live on campus, and who does it, where does it live, who does it sit next to, in a sense. American models um, emphasize the integration of student affairs into the academic experience at faculty level, and have developed, um, student affairs is an academic discipline in the, in, in, Amer in, the, in the US. So there the idea is that student affairs, as it is, needs to be partnered and integrated into the academic life and into the faculty at, um, at the university. The European student affairs models are located in Bernstein's official recontextualizing field and are really located within the kind of bureaucratic part of the welfare state. Now in Europe and, and perhaps the political issue as well, the states, of course, well, the social welfare um, is, a, is, a, 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 um, is very well developed, unlike in the states where there's very little uh, welfare, unlike we have. And so the thinking, of course, is that the community, that the state must take care of the issues that student affairs does. Here we have kind of an elitist thinking where we say only our students benefit from this, as in America as well. It's kind of a thinking that once you're a student, then you get these kinds of services that student affairs provides, um, that we don't provide to the people outside. Um, so there are different models that, are, that uh, also are influenced by political sort of um, contexts. And then the European Council of Student Affairs locates itself within the social, or locates student affairs in the social domain and declares itself responsible for the student experience. So that's come up since 2007 when they were in Bergen and said, how do we strategize, how do we position ourselves within universities? Where do we live? In which field? 
Um, just briefly, student affairs theory, just as background, um, there's two strands really. The one is developmental theory, student affairs rests on um, individualistic theories. It addresses issues of human growth, mainly from psychological theory. There's a focus on the intra and interpersonal factors which affect and are affected by learning, cognitive and personal social development. The other cluster of theories that student affairs rests itself on, so it's, um, it's got two clusters, is environmental impact theory, which addresses the interplay between the environment factor, environmental factors and the student. So it looks, about, uh, it looks at how does the student experience the campus? How does, it, um, does the student feel alienated or received by or feels it belongs or feels attached to a campus? Or how does the campus enable opportunities for engagement? There's a focus on engagement and social and academic integration. Obviously, we're familiar with Tinta, but I can see everybody claims sort of, you know, legions with Tinta these days. Um, there's similar work um, of Tinta, obviously, Aston, and Kuhn, Pascarella, that informs student affairs practice as we know it today. Just briefly, what is another interesting thing, and I'm not going to go into it here, but I couldn't leave out that point. It is a very exciting point. It's about thinking about a structural, structural representation of how the student affairs, how is it structurally positioned at a university. Our student affairs is centrally positioned. We've got a central, very high level of student affairs. We have a DVC for student affairs. Um, so it's a, very, um, it's a very narrow, very centralized um, model um, that has no lateral connections with, um, or horizontal connections with any of the other domains, no formal ones at least. Um, um, and you'll see later that I'm trying to speak about the, 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 the program we're facilitating on the science faculty, how that model then is so poorly matched to what needs to happen on the ground in these integrated programs in the first year experiences and how the structural model is already kind of such a, uh, uh, there's such a disjuncture between that. Um, so just briefly about the, the theoretical um, sort of assertions that um, tell us why we should integrate student affairs into the life, into the academic life of an institution. The insertion of integration is based on the assumption that learning is synergistic and not segmented. So cognitive and affective dimensions of development are related parts of one process. Parity in psychosocial and cognitive development is key for the process in learning. And you know, one example always is when, when, when we ask students to, to critically evaluate something or to comment and, uh, uh, um, or, or do something else. To critically evaluate something means you've got to hold two position, an equal position, an equal validity in your mind. That has to do with a personal maturity. That can't just be done by a six-year-old or a 10-year-old or a 14-year-old. They really struggle. It's either kind of either the goodie or the baddie, but you can't be both. And so, so to be certain cognitive functions, certain cognitive things we ask our students to do can only happen um, if there is a particular level of um, um, social, social um, personal development. And Case is particularly big on that one of making meaning is related to self-authorship, Aston as well. The self is a co cohesive and continuous um, construct which develops while cognitive structures develop. So while we expect students to develop cognitive structures, and we ask our first generation students to develop a new quality of cognitive structures, not just more of the same. We ask them to do something different. And that has to do with identity formation. At the same time, it has an impact on personal social development. And that is how student affairs, in many ways, kind of augments the process of cognitive development. So separating academic from personal social, from, from the personal social, is reductionist and artificial. Um, integration, just um, to continue on that one, um, I'm not sure why this has bolded itself. Is this what this? No, no, it doesn't. All right. Student affairs contribution is predicated on the integration um, into the academic affairs and institutional affairs. And, and really, I'm citing um, very influential um, um, authors in that field. Um, so the integration needs to be at the site and the moment of learning. Integration means that we need to do things where students develop cognitively at first, second, third year level. That is where student affairs need to be active and be part of. It's no use splitting it off and having a workshop on a Saturday morning or having things done after hours that are unrelated to the discipline, unrelated to the faculties. Um, 
it's, it's just simply renders it ineffectual. I mean, you'll ask a, it's so interesting, your survey earlier on about, you know, perceptions. I mean, if you ask students coming out of workshops, most people will have loved workshops. You know, workshops have to be very bad before people don't like them. People like talking about themselves, people like um, being part of groups, and so people love workshops, really. How it changes their behavior six months down the line, workshops are not effective unless they're integrated into a framework, into a disciplinary, usually a disciplinary framework. So, um, yeah, so it um, has to do with um, the integration. Learning, the third point here, learning should be viewed as a comprehensive, holistic, informative activity that, inter uh, that integrates academic learning and student affairs. I'm just going to talk faster then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, there's a need for the redefinition of learning as a broad process. Take some of your question time. Okay. So just quickly, I want to talk to you about the extended program ICS, which is an integrated, which is an integrated program in the first year extended program in the science faculty. The program really has um, a component of literacies, information literacies, language literacies. It has what we call the living and learning, which is the student affairs people in it. And of course, it's got physics and maths and these other things. Um, we started in 2009 with Vivian and Delia. Um, it was an IOP initiative. So it was initiated, it was initiated with the funding from the IOP, and I think it's quite interesting how that kind of was the thinking. Um, but you might be familiar with that. I just want to go on quickly because of time. I sent out questionnaires that I'd asked 14 people with in, in, are involved in facilitating the program, and I wanted to find out how they experience it. So let me just go back. The research question is really, how do staff experience the integration of these two domains, the student affairs with the academic world? So briefly, the themes that emerged, um, and there are six themes that I, that, I, that I drew out, and I just want to highlight that it's, it's really not about generalizing things. It's trying to find out insights and see if we can get certain insights from this rather than generalizing over um, the experiences of all staff. The first is that there's a domain and territoriality came up as an issue. Issues around who is in and who's out and who belongs to this community seems not clear. And one of the people said, sometimes there are meetings in our faculty in the, in the first year extended program, sometimes there are meetings which exclude student support staff and they're told that it isn't relevant to them. But then you think we're all part of a team, so I'm not sure why they're excluded sometimes. So, you know, does it reflect kind of the earlier points I made about the different fields? Then power and ownership um, of success came up as an issue. Um, power and expert issues and in our group tensions um, seemed that they sorry, and these numbers are always the, the people who said it. Um, so there are some issues around who owns success as opposed to seeing students as a win-win. There are moments when there's a power struggle around which interpretation, which understanding we should follow. So they imagine they sit in kind of meetings and they think about, well, should we do it this way and that way? And it's not clear. And I suppose with all this uh, cross-disciplinary and disciplinary groups, that is so. But there was kind of this power struggle around that. The academics then decide on the content and the earnest, so and the others, which are less academic, <laughs> can be less academic and more academic, um, need to adjust to set program. So those are two themes there. The third one is, the disjuncture of fields, and I thought that was a very sort of nice um, quote there, is that, that there are gaps between the decision makers and the implementers. So, yeah, or the other quote says, decision makers are separate <coughs> from the facilitators. Um, and that's quite nice that there was a perception of, you know, the policy makers and people do IOP, not that they're separate, but I'm saying that there was a perception of at some level the decisions are made, and that decision then migrates and arrives in the classroom, and it's really mismatched to what goes on in the classroom. Um, and that's what the disjuncture of the, the, the migration of this knowledge of the decisions. The next thing is the disjuncture of practices. <clears throat> so there are challenges around complying with dominant practices, such as formative and summative assessments and academic performances as positivistic indicators of success. Um, so the quote is very nice. Um, it's hard for student development to quantitatively provide assessments assessment marks about student participation in the living and learning component. But we need to find a way to, of documenting progress, but we haven't found a good indicator yet, so that's really frustrating. But that's kind of a moment where we need to fit in with the dominant way of doing it. <coughs> the dominant way of doing it is we, have, we quantify, we put it to a test in the assessment, we mark it, and then that gets entered in mass. And it's really hard in some of these, certainly the student affairs practices, how do we do that? How do we quantify the benefit or the experience that students have in our programs? When do we define success? What is success? 
Um, so that is one of the examples of where, where the two fields meet and, and, and are really not finding it easy to negotiate. <coughs> and the next quote also says that. Um, and then the last um, quote, uh, uh, the last theme is about experts. Oh, there was a very nice thing about the e-technologies um, field. Where it, it, it appears that nobody really is a specialist in it, and it seems that that's a space where people really feel empowered to have conversations with one another. Um, so the integration of the, domain, uh, of the domains is facilitated by the lack of being, uh, by the equality of, of the members. So the quote there says, what works really well is that our use of e-technologies, we're all novices, so the playing field is leveled. The next one says, the use of multimedia resources in sessions and utilizing the e-teaching site has facilitated the integration process. Last theme, um, the epistemic community. And you recall from the beginning when I was talking about what is an epistemic community, it's a community of multidisciplinary people that come together around a shared goal. Um, and I think that that is kind of a space where we're finding it, an awareness of many disciplines, shared goal, the shared commitment, and an understanding. This is the making of an epistemic community. And the quotes really came from a lot of people, or oh, a lot, the, the uh, 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 9 out of 14 that replied, there was a lot of responses around that. What they're saying was that what works is embracing the diversity within a multidisciplinary team. We all focus on student success, regardless of where we come from. Frequent meetings that sure we communicate, sharing our attitude to work, sharing a vision, cross-referencing all the time. It seems like a nice group of committed people that we're working with. Constant cross-references by facilitators around the content seems to work well. So the conclusion, um, just, just very quickly, that there's a recognition of various fields, contexts and pockets at UWC. We're aware of that. Um, and there's a recognition for the necessity to find ways to work across that. The process of integrating student affairs and academic affairs is complex and demanding. It's not easy. You can't just kind of, as a policy decision, say, do that, and then we sit with not knowing to do that. The integration requires, uh, is required in terms of content, structure, management and implementation. Obviously, um, the, to bridge fields and context, structure and systems, issues need to be addressed, so we need to have conversations about that. Um, epistemic communities need to be fostered and supported, and this involves cross-disciplinary conversations and projects with shared goals. And I think that's my last point here, that ICS is a case study which demonstrates the value of this kind of integration. And I think there's a lot to learn from that model um, in, in the ICS where we, have, where we have found that we have student affairs and academic affairs people sit together year, well, week after week really, and try to find a way of marrying the two systems, the two fields that they come from. about the sustaining, it's very, very difficult. I think there's initially a pilot, we had a lot of energy when I remember 2009 and 10, we had a lot of staff and a lot of supervision, a lot of energy went into it. Well, that's just simply not sustainable. Or perhaps these programs are perhaps only made under these conditions. Then we need to create the resources for that. So there needs to be, you know, our current formula says that if you're teaching an extended program, that's the money you get and that's how many lectures you get. Well, that formula doesn't apply to what we find on the ground. This doesn't apply, it, it doesn't work for us. It doesn't work for, 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 for this program, which is a very successful program. So we need to think about the, 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 the practices and the, and, the, and, the, and the rules and the, and, the, and, the, and the assumptions in the official field when they make assumptions about how it ought to work. 
And then when we sit in the classroom in our first year experience or in the, in the, in the extended program, it doesn't <coughs> apply. And, and yeah, so yeah. psychological, social way for them to become cognitively more competent. It has to do with that together. And the Europeans are catching on to this. And there's huge discussions um, on, the, on, the, on the European sites on how do we bring these state services, which are kind of merely just provided services, into the university space in order to augment cognitive functioning, to not see it as a separate service provision, but it has to do with an integration of, of aspects. But I didn't answer that. Thank you very much.